going to record this session, um, which I'm hoping is now recording off my computer. Um, but thank you again. Thank you very much to everybody for coming. Um, we've got people here from London. We've got people here from Houston, Rotterdam, uh, Denver. And we've even got my colleague has dialed in from Vienna. So I can only assume she's there for work because I know she definitely doesn't live in Vienna. Um, but thank you for joining us from all around the world. Um, today's session, I'm going to focus on the data architecture and management um, exam. Now, just a little introduction. Um, my name is Gemma. Um, and I've been working on Salesforce for about 10 years now. This is my this year, this April is my 10th anniversary of working with Salesforce. Um, I started a bit of a crazy crusade last year with getting some certifications um, done. I had some time on my hands, so I decided to use it or at least attempt to use it productively. Um, and it resulted in getting a, getting um, to where I am now, which is um, a double certified architect. Um, and my, with that, my goals had actually changed to be to start working towards CTA. So that's a plan for the rest of this year. However, not all of us, um, you know, are necessarily aspiring to do CTA, um, which is absolutely fine. Um, I had no plans of doing it last year at all, really, until until the certification program picked up at um, Blue Wolf, where I work. And I was interested in 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 pursuing at least certified application architect. And I was just going to leave it there. I was quite happy to leave it there. Um, so in terms of um, exams that lead up to that particular um, qualification, um, today we would like to sort of have a look at data architecture and management and go through and just work through a few examples um, of situations that might come up in the exam. So do feel free to ask questions at any time. Um, I'm not monitoring the chat, so you will have to unmute yourself and do feel free to interrupt interrupt me. I won't take it personally. Um, before we start, I just would like to do a bit of a shout out to our December and January champions. So these are, uh, well, I'm not going to shout my own trumpet, but there are four lovely, fantastic women who have joined our Ladies Be Architects group and achieved certifications in December and January. So. We had Carrie, who achieved her sharing and visibility designer. Round of applause to Carrie. We have Julia, who achieved sharing and visibility designer as well. We have Louise, who did data architecture and management and sharing and visibility designer. And we have Charlie, who achieved her identity and access management designer, which made her a system architect. So congratulations to everybody who's achieved a certification. If there's anybody on here that I've missed um, that, or that I don't know about and they've achieved a certification, please feel free to give me a shout afterwards and I'll make sure that we celebrate your success in the group. That's what we're all about. So, as I said, today's um, content, we're going to be focusing on data architecture and management designer. So thank you very much to everybody who voted um, to take on this particular topic. And we're going to be looking at data governance and stewardship today. It's not a large part of the exam, but it is really important in terms of making, um, enabling you to have those kind of conversations with customers um, because it's, it is a big piece of work. It is a large part of any implementation that you're working on. You'll be spending quite a lot of time talking about best practices for managing data. So this exam um, will help you to do that, but also this study group is aiming to assist you both with the exam and in holding those kind of conversations, um, whether it's within your own organization as an administrator, or whether it's within your client organizations if you are in a customer facing role. So we'll look at data governance, we'll look at data stewardship, and we'll look at some of the tools that you can use and, and features in Salesforce that you can leverage to assist you with that. We'll have a look at some of the types of data that you could be having conversations around governance for. We'll look at what factors, um, what factors can affect data quality and the roles and responsibilities of um, a data governance pro within a data governance program. And we'll look at also how you can um, put your plan together um, for establishing good data governance and stewardship patterns. And then we'll if we have time, we'll look at an example from the resource guide from the examination, which is, um, I, I think, a fantastic way to look at um, 
data data strategy and governance when you're implementing and it's based on some real life horror stories um, that Salesforce have very kindly put together for us and it's I think many of us will find that quite amusing when we read it because we've I'm sure most of us have come up with have come up against these situations before. Um, we'll do some Q&A, we'll look at some next steps uh, for study and, and I will share some great resources with you. So I'll stop waffling on now and get into it. So data governance is effectively the, fo the following principles. Um, do feel free to make notes if it will help you later on. Um, effectively, data governance looks at what is being collected. So what data are you going to track? Um, how you're going to keep that secure, particularly um, at the moment when there are a lot of conversations going on with European clients around GDPR. Um, we're wanting to look at how it's kept, secu set, kept secure, but also the purpose of that data and why we want to keep it. Data governance is also about looking at who can create, who can manage and who can update that data. What quality needs to be kept? Um, and stand how sorry start again I got nervous um, what quality rules and standards need to be met within your organization to make sure it can be used in a purposeful way how available that data is and how usable it is if you've having to go and click in lots of different places just to find out how many invoices somebody has been has received um, then that becomes quite a big part of that data governance and a large part forms a large part of your design as well and also the processes for managing um, any conflicts that you might come across. So, for example, you've got a subscriber in Salesforce, which is a customer record, and the address is different between your um, record in Salesforce and your transactional system, for example, SAP. Um, and that can have quite a large effect on your entire process, which then has a knock on effect on customer satisfaction, etc. When you start mailing the wrong letters to the wrong addresses and so on. So it's a really quite important factor of um, those solutions. So the features are that we would be so how that translates into different features and, and solutions within a particular implementation. So integration is a large way that data is collected. Um, certainly, if you're using Salesforce as a repository for customer information, you may be collecting that in initi initially. You may be collecting that from a transactional system as an initial load, and then you're letting the users take over. Um, so the data, so the users will be collecting that data um, and also the integrations will be taking that and, and pushing it into other systems. So whilst you might be working on a Salesforce project and the, your, your personal scope or your project scope might only be looking at how data is collected and distributed within Salesforce. Actually, it has a much wider implication because if you've got a number of other systems that are relying on your on, on there being good quality customer data such as an invoicing system then as an architect we start to look at the, at the much bigger picture um, even if we can't necessarily affect it because it's not in our project scope we can still um, be asked about this by customers so it's definitely something important to consider then you have the way that you can control access to that data. So in, in Salesforce, that roughly translates towards profiles and permission sets and also some, some elements of sharing. So controlling the level of access people have to data, who can create it, who can update it. Part of gov uh, data governance strategy is, is looking at whether the, the division of um, responsibility between your sales users, your service users, for example. So a real life example I'm working on at the moment is there is um, there are insurance policies coming into Salesforce and the governance strategy um, is that the users who are in customer contact center should not be able to change that that information because it, Salesforce is not the, the system of record for those insurance policies. However, it is the system of record for any activity around those policies. And I just set Alexa off. Whoops. <laughs> so profiles, permission sets, and um, all of and and the sharing of that data forms a large part of um, this solution. Other solutions and features you have the deduplication tools available in Salesforce. So things like matching rules, deduplication rules, data.clock data.com 
Um, I remember this coming up briefly in the exam in a very subtle way. It was um, a very different question. And I think the it was it was testing your knowledge of the different ways that you can handle duplication in the system. Um, one of the other items I've, I wanted to put on this slide was around app exchange tools. So I'm sure some of you will have come across a tool called Demand Tools. Um, this is a fantastic app exchange package. Um, you know, it's expensive, so you tend to see it in larger or enterprise situations, but it is a really, really effective tool that you can use to support your data governance strategy um, on an ongoing basis. And certainly um, those of you who've worked in Lightning recently, you will have noticed that there is a standard component you can drop in, um, which shows you if there are any potential duplicates in the system. Um, so that's quite an effective tool that you can use to help you manage your duplicates at the entry level. Certainly if users are collecting that data and putting it into Salesforce, there are lots of different strategies you can apply and that's one of them. <laughs> So to produce great quality data. So we know that there are lots and lots of features in Salesforce. These are just a few that I've used over the years to help govern data quality. Uh, validation rules are an obvious one. I try not to use those too often though. I did change my strategy um, after a couple of years consulting because I was finding with if you have too many validation rules, then it can have a big effect on user adoption, certainly for hitting errors everywhere. And I'm sure some of you will have um, had situations where somebody's come up against one of your validation rules and sent you an email and said, why isn't this working properly? And then you've copied and pasted the actual error message that you've written into the email and sent it back and they've gone, oh, I didn't know that, thanks. And they go off and fix the data themselves. It's one of those things. Um, defaults, uh, whilst they've, yeah. Yes, I will certainly share them, yeah. And I'll share the video as well. No problem, anytime. Um, so another uh, strategy you can use is defaulting, even though it's quite limited. We all wish we could just create def um, default formulas based on different objects, but you then get shown the user and the system and the custom settings and all of that. Um, but where you can, I find defaulting to be a good way to ensure data quality. Um, so we have an inception date on a policy and I've just defaulted that to um, equals now. Um, effectively, which is the created date, but it still allows users to override it if possible. And it means that they don't have, they have one less field to fill in unless they really do need to change it. Um, with the introduction of Lightning, we've got these fantastic things called actions now where you can predefine your field values. So if you wanted to create a new complaint, for example, you could actually automatically populate the account name, the customer name um, and the record type based on them clicking an action which says new complaint. Um, so it's another good strategy for pushing the data in or making sure that the data generates itself rather than a user, relying on a user. Um, field settings, so creating fields that are unique um, and fields that are required at that level, um, but also being able to define those um, mandatory field settings on page layouts is a useful way to do it too. Um, and it's actually a preferred way for, for me because I've just come across too many situations with managed packages in the past where someone wants to change something and um, they don't have permission to edit the field and it's actually a piece of code that's changing it and not a person. So I've tended to find that the, the safest route has been to make things required at page layout level, but it's just um, a learning that I've had. For some reason, I've put validation rules in there twice. I must have been tired. Um, another way to handle and produce great quality data is through automation. If you, for example, if you are producing data off the back of another action, um, so let's say you have an opportunity get set to closed one and you want to produce, automatically produce a renewal, then you can actually use automation to send data into the fields um, on your new opportunity for your renewal opportunity. And then that way it's, it's correct right at the point of entry and just enables um, users to be more productive because they only have to focus on the fields that they need to change. And then there's data.com, which um, has functionality for cleansing and deduping data. So all of this um, 
data governance would be nothing without um, data stewardship. And what stewardship means is that you have certain people whose job it is, is to monitor the collection of data and make sure that it's of a good standard. I remember days when I used to do it as an admin, sometimes I come across an address that I just did not like and I'd sit there and change it or I would go and speak to people and, and ask them to change it just and these days you've got functionality such as Chatter that, that, help, that is an enabler for this kind of role. Um, responding to questions about data is an absolutely key um, activity for data stewards, um, certainly because people, people at work want to make sure that they're putting the right information in. And if they're presented with a number of options and they're not sure which one to collect, then, then that's a key um, question that you'll be asked. And you tend to find admins doing that. In terms of um, conflicts, if you've got, for example, the as the example I used earlier was the was an incorrect address between two systems, um, then a, another key uh, responsibility for anyone who's taking on that stewardship role is to is to ensure that the systems are both updated to the correct data, and of course the best people who will know that are the people who are customer facing. So it's an integral role in making sure there is consistency between the systems. So the tools you can use to be a good data steward, you can use data quality scoring and you could use that. There are a number of different packages out there that can help you to do that and define your quality setting. But if you're if you'd rather sit, if you'd rather build something that is corresponds to your own business rules, then there's nothing stopping you creating formulae, um, creating workflows that would score a particular piece of data and then maybe perhaps prevent a salesperson from progressing down the sales process until they filled in all the pieces of information that you need or that management need. Another way to do this is through data quality dashboards. Um, keeping them positive is, is a really um, important part of that as well. Um, I've built a few dashboards in the past that can be shared via chatter as well. That's also a really good way of ensuring data quality. And if you've got a sales operations office or if you're if you have a project management office, for example, then that could be something that they can be assisting with um, by monitoring those dashboards and just kind of calling out situations where the data is not so good um, and, and asking managers for support in making sure that that data looks that data is clean and reportable. This is particularly important if you are taking the information you're collecting and then reporting it to, say, a regulatory authority. Um, there are some really good analyzers as well out there on the App Exchange um, that help you assess the completeness of your data um, and also helps you to make good decisions um, about how about whether you should retire certain fields or whether there are other fields that are absolutely crucial and therefore you need to watch out if there are any requests to change them and so on. Talked about chatter, but then there's also this thing called conversation that people sometimes have um, either in person over the phone or through conference call, um, where actually you could sit and make yourself available to people, even if it's just for an hour a week as an administrator, just to get, just to give people an opportunity and a safe place to come and speak to you about or ask questions about Salesforce and how, you know, what, what's the best way to ensure that their manager's not on their case every week about bad data. So the types of data that we could be looking at um, in your systems um, tend to be things like master data. So you're, you will usually have a system of record within an organization. Typically, what we tended to see, but not always, is that Salesforce is used as, a, as, as the main system of record for customer data and for prospect data. But you can also see transactional and ERP systems being the master for that particular um, element too. Um, I'm working on a project where Salesforce is effectively the interaction point for users in the contact center, but the system of record for customers is an is a bespoke homemade system which contains everything that they need and needs to be the master because it feeds lots of other different systems so it's almost on a hierarchical basis um, the second type is your transactional data so things like orders contracts um, payment information invoicing all of those things 
Then you have your reference data. So that could be things like your currencies, your exchange rates, um, your SIC codes. They could be a classification. So when you classify customers um, as active or inactive, what does that mean to your business? And then metadata, things like how many times has, how many times has this record been viewed? How many um, activities have been logged, etc. And help you measure things like adoption and quality itself. So the main factors that, that affect data quality are, include the age of the data, how long you've had it for, um, and whether it's up to date. And certainly when you're looking at um, starting a data migration exercise, certainly for new implementations, or if you're bringing another um, department or business unit on board, you start to look at the data that they want to bring with them and where they can get it from and how old it is. So time is an important factor. Completeness. So this is looking at how many fields you're actually collecting data for and helps you make decisions around the design of your application. Do we need to make certain fields required at a certain point because we are missing that key insight and our business needs needs a piece, a piece of information to make a decision? Um, so that can help guide your thoughts around um, how you design that. Um, accuracy, things like phone numbers. Um, there are tools that you can use such as data.com um, and OneSource and Experian and things like that to pull in um, information about which companies roll up into which head offices. Um, also getting contact information and, and just cross-checking that phone numbers are accurate and correct. There are a number of tools that you can look at though, look at to assist you with that accuracy. Um, I've even seen some organisations get temps in to phone up and just check phone details. It's not ideal, but not in this day and age when there are so many databases you can check against, but it's just another way. Uh, consistency, the example I mentioned earlier, again, making sure that all of your systems have the same single record of that customer with the same telephone number, the same date of birth, for example. Um, making sure you don't have too many duplicates and actually looking at the data that's how often that data is being used. It's great to collect data about somebody's likes, you know, if they like pink ice cream more than they like chocolate ice cream. But if that's not being used for any particular business benefit like marketing or, you know, event planning, for example, if you then what's the point in having it? So that's another consideration. These factors do come up in the exam, so it's a good idea to, to know about this because you may be asked um, about how to assess good quality data in the certification exam. And really what I found most useful throughout my study was to remember that data does follow a linear process. You have your records being created because they're needed for some reason. Um, someone will use that data in order to service a customer or record the quality of a relationship with a customer. Um, but eventually as well, this data is going to is, is collected in order to produce insights via reports or via um, dashboards and so on. They may even be handed over to other systems to support transactions and things like invoicing, which is absolutely fundamental to the business. And then eventually that data may fall out of use or it may be in continuous use and you may be looking at, at different solutions for making, making sure you can still access that data, but you're reducing the amount of data that you're holding in the system in order to improve the performance of your database. So typical roles and responsibilities in a governance framework might, will include your data stewards. Um, these might typically be end users if they're creating the data. So if they're in sales, support, marketing, um, they're out on the road, they're putting things in through their phone. They're effectively data stewards because they're custodians of that data. They own that data. And certainly in Salesforce, there's no hiding because you do actually physically own that data. <laughs> So it's so it's important to remember that it's the users who are prime primary data stewards. But then you have in a, a additional individuals who will take on that responsibility, too. So people who look after the system for a living, admins, 
um, super users and operations people, for example. So no one's going to process your contract if it doesn't have a proposed start date. And we don't know that it's we don't know when the first date of pay, that payment's going to be taken. So it's the it's the role of the ops people to ensure that that data is complete. And often you see companies in, implementing approval processes to manage and ensure that that data is um, is correct and complete. Um, in addition, you will be working with um, consultants, architects and admins who effectively will be checking and monitoring the flow of that data, making sure it's still being used and resolving any issues that take place. So, again, the example of the mismatching addresses between two systems, it may be that your administrator has to log a ticket to the IT department to update an address in the back office system so that the customer um, so that the customer is invoiced at the correct address, or it could be an architect designing an integration that takes care of that. So if the customer's the, uh, address changes, it automatically updates all the other systems in the, in, the, in the business. So effectively, that is a data stewardship activity, even though it is integration. You have your data governance committee, and their role is to resolve these problems. So they might be they might not even be necessarily in a com in a formal committee. They might just be champions who have elected to take on these jobs and these tasks. But they resolve the problems that are escalated to them um, by making sure that the systems are all updated correctly, um, by making sure that there's alignment between if there's any ad additional solutions going into any of those systems, making sure that the right people are talking to each other at the design stage. And then managing the um, integrity and quality of data and how and the measures for for that particular initiative is also a key responsibility um, just to ensure that the um, management who are sitting a layer above that are aware of or can monitor the success of the, the strategy and governance processes that are in place. Um, for those of you who are implementing projects to customers, um, you'll come across these, these roles um, probably quite far down the design process once you feel or while your fields are being um, while your fields are being produced and defined. And certainly during build, because we all know that fields can come and go and, and, and be added at any stage throughout the project. So this would be an, an, an ongoing activity that may result in a charter at the end of the implementation for them to move forward with. So then you have your data governance council. So these are the people who set policies and provide strategic direction um, for that. And again, this could be one person or it could be a role that is occupied by several different people within your project team. You have your steering committee and they're making sure that the data governance processes are working and they're sponsoring the activities of that, of that data governance office as well. And it's the data governance office that's actually actively working with the business to build those, to build your governance solutions. So if you decide, for example, you're going to put in um, some list views and some dashboards that will help monitor um, how, well, how well your opportunities are being completed and how much data you're collecting about leads, for example, um, then it's your data governance office who's looking at that um, those dashboards and defining the and, and as well as the um, governance committee they're defining the metrics that you're going to be um, building on your dashboard and making sure that those metrics are reaching the right people so they can make the right decisions. So planning your strategy, when you get further down the project and the customer starts or your business starts asking about how are we going to keep this data clean and reliable, then, then these I just want to share some practices with you from a number of Salesforce blogs that I've been trawling for the last few days. And this is all about um, the steps that you would take towards implementing a, an effective governance strategy. So before you can start, you've got to have a look at what's going on at the moment and what the pain points are. So, and that that's really starts with the who, what, where, why, when. So who's using it? Why are they using it? How are they using it? Which data is actually being used and what for? 
what decisions are being driven by these by these particular elements of data are we collecting data just for the sake of it because it would be nice um i had a, a challenge today where um where somebody said they wanted to um track the basis of um the basis of consent, and this is an interesting one, it was, you know, prone to debate. Um, they wanted, so uh, the business just wanted to know if the customer had actually consented to have their details in. They didn't need anything more than that. The IT department was saying they, they needed to be able to record that consent as a number of different records against one customer so that they could, and this is because they're dealing with, they wanted to split it between personal data, sensitive data, which is an absolute fair point. Um, the interesting part of that is it was 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 actually the solution might be that it's not a Salesforce solution necessarily. So if, if the business is looking at a customer record, they just need to see that the customer's happy um, because they have to ask if the customer's happy to keep their personal data for for us to keep their personal data. But from a compliance perspective, the IT department already has number multiple different systems that analyze consent and can therefore report upon it. The challenge, therefore, is actually what happens if that changes because your agents are on the front line collecting that data. So that was an, in an interesting strategy to go through today. Balancing the quality, uh, balancing this um, is, is what does the business actually need and what is the quality like at the moment? If you've got inconsistencies, so for example, um, you know you've got some some people some people have recorded um, a, an account type as active customer, and then you have two, and then an administrator's gone in and created um, a pick list value called customer, and then status active. That consistency is a really important analysis to take that needs to take place. And helps you assess the quality of the data that you have, and if you are needing, if it's causing any confusion in reporting that data. And of course, looking at who's creating it, how is it being created or changed? Is it being done by an automation? Is it being done by a human being? Is it being done by an integration? Um, are there certain teams that are only allowed to touch that data, etc.? So, so ultimately, you can end up doing a big write-up. Um, of your analysis of your current state analysis and before you can actually move on to the next stage which is developing your plan so as part of that plan defining the data that you're going to keep obviously quite important so you need to put your data model together and then perhaps an analysis of who who, who you expect to um, produce that data and monitor that data defining your standards what makes a good account record does it mean that you're go, you can't assess that until you've put in a, a data quality score, for example? And then how are you going to put that data quality score in? Are you going to build it yourself? Is the business going to define it? Is the IT department going to define it? Uh, they're all important things to consider. And much of the architect exams um, are centered around what are the things that an architect needs to consider? So defining roles and owners. Uh, making sure that you're you're comfortable with who does what to what record and who gets to see what record and devising ways to monitor and control the quality of those of those elements of data as well. So planning your dashboards um, and planning your your scoring systems. Implementing your plan. Well, the hardest part is getting people on board. So you want to get mobilized, start your project team. Uh, establish your committee and your steering and your council and then you can start the project in terms of um, in terms of this kind of approach making you know to implementing a governance framework you often find it's a project in itself aside from implementing any new solutions because you're ultimately having to build some functionality whether it's validation rules or page layouts or uh, reports and dashboards Ultimately, there will be some some uh, metadata changes that you'll need to make. Um, and obviously, the sandbox is the best place to do that. And then any data fixes. Um, good practice is to is to have a rehearsal. So um, have a go at doing any data, any transformations and fixes in the sandbox. Obviously, if you've got tools like demand tools, that helps you to run a query within Salesforce and then update, update records based on a rule without exporting, which is really, really nice. 
Um, but if you really love CSV files, then please go ahead and use the data loader. Um, unfortunately, I haven't, haven't had the luxury of using demand tools for about seven years now. So that's been my life for a while. And I'm comfortable with that. I just prefer other things. Um, and then, of course, rinse and repeat in production when you're ready. Once you've had your users test it, of course, to make sure that it's going to work and that it's data they can work with. Building and monitoring your dashboards and using your chatter to drive good behavior. So the hardest part of this is the change management side, the human side, making sure that you've got really good, strong sponsorship and champions that can support users. Becca, did you have a question? OK, sorry, I saw you got unmuted. <laughs> OK. Um, and of course, once you've gone live, that's only the beginning of the story, right? So um, being able to establish regular committees, boards. We used to have an admin forum at my first job where we would get together and we would talk about we would our agenda would typically be this is what we this is what each country wants to change can we change it? And we would all talk about it and decide if it was a yes or no. And then the second half of it was about what data cleansing initiatives were going on and how we could support one another with it. So that, and we found that quite successful, to be quite successful. We managed to reclassify probably about 70% of our customer base, which helped our marketing team, which helped our new business team. And that was all because we just did some cleaning up. Um, another thing we had as well, actually, I'm just thinking back to my days at Financial Force, we had a clean your room dashboard. And I know many many organizations adopt this, but it was for each salesperson. They would have their own filtered list of um, items that they needed to, to, to clean up in order to keep their pipeline strong. So I think if I was to go through this article, it would probably consume another 20 minutes. So I'm going to just refer you to a blog post that is shown in the resource guide for this exam. Um, it's absolutely brilliant. It's called Salesforce Anti-Patterns, A Cautionary Tale. And it has some really, really good examples of where a project, and of course, in, in amazing Salesforce style, it tells you the story of um, an implementation where they are loading very, very large amounts of data and the, it tells you all about the decisions that they make and basically the knock on effect of those decisions. Um, it's referenced in the resource guide for a really good reason, because it, it doesn't just talk about governance and um, strategy. It also talks help will help you a lot with the master data management and large data volume side of the certification exam. Um, plus, it will also just give you a few things to giggle about as well when you when you you see these lovely individuals haplessly, you know, driving towards the abyss with their data. So uh, but it will help you a lot with their with your certification exam. So I'll just refer you to that if that's OK. And the link is on the slides, which I will share. So I would just like to take this opportunity to um, open up for any questions or comments or feedback, anything that you would like to contribute. I think one of the things that um, that Louise said recently um, was in the, in the forum was that um, if you've got a good solid understanding of the exam material plus you've got some experience, then you're in a really really good position for this. Um, in terms of what's the easier, I'm probably not the best person to ask because I spent 18 months as an administrator when I first started out. So sharing and visibility was just something that I did day in, day out. So for me, that was a very, well, not very simple exam, but it was a reasonably simple exam um, because I'd had, because I had the experience, but that didn't mean I, I didn't have to study because I did. I studied my, studied my, myself to death. But in terms of data architecture, it, it's challenging in the sense that there are a few 
things that you need to know about the bulk API. Um, and, if, and there are a couple of concepts that are brand new. So things like primary key chunking. Um, when I first read that, I went, what on earth is that? And I just started to look through it. Um, but after a while, because I, I could understand it visually, it started to make sense. So I think, I don't, I don't think one exam is, is particularly harder. I don't think data is, is harder than sharing or sharing is harder than data. I think they're both equally as challenging. Um, but as with data sharing and integration exams, there's a lot of crossover between the three. So I would just say um, it's worth it. It's worth practicing, and it's and it's and I find that putting things into a visual format made it easier to study. So thing with things like the bulk API, it was talking about parallel mode and serial mode, and I couldn't really understand it until I actually took a step back and drew it. Does that answer your question? There are, I would say the most, the most challenging topics are the bulk API. Um, and you, you are given a number of scenarios where you've got several different systems of record and you have to figure out the best way um the, the the best way to make sure that you are not br not breaking salesforce while you're pushing large data volumes in and also you, the, like the best methods of getting that data in between the systems as well you're welcome hi nikki Hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, my client at the moment, as I say, is their insurance company. And they've just completed a master data management project because they just had they you could you could search for one customer and you get about 17 different results across all the different systems and they all had different IDs and all different attributes and so on. So they've just completed a project to produce what's called the U unified customer data layer. And that's basically just their terminology for for MDM, master data management where you kind of, if you imagine it hierarchically, you've got several different systems all feeding into one layer and that one layer just contains customer data. Um, and it's, and I think what Salesforce is saying is best practice is that it's better to integrate with that layer than it is to try and in, try and plug into each of the individual systems. So that's where the crossover is with the integration um, exam as well. Okay, thank you for your question. Do we have any more? Mm. Yep. Definitely. Definitely, definitely, definitely. Um, 
certainly for identity and access management, um, I made the mistake of, um, well, I'll tell I was helping some people out and I had different, slightly different resources and the objective was to test the resources. Um, so I try, so I, I only studied those resources and um, when I got into the exam, um, I got some nasty surprises. So, however, the second time I did the exam and I found this to be true of all the architecture exams so far, um, is that if you don't if you if you study the resource guide and you study all of it um i mean i just worked my way through it and wrote my own notes um for for everything whether it was core or recommended um but obviously a, a good strategy if you're wanting to prior if you if you don't want to work that way or you don't have time to work that way a good way to prioritize it is to look at the weightings for the exam and focus on those areas as a priority um, but yeah, like you, Julia, I just found that if you, you you're in a much stronger position if you study the whole guide. Yeah, yeah, they are. Yeah, I think that's Salesforce trying to tell you how hard it is. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, is everyone okay for me to move on? So next steps then um, for your study, what I can recommend is if you are in a position to hold a workshop or at least attend a workshop where you're talking about data governance and strategy, it's a really good opportunity for you to use your, your knowledge, your new knowledge and, and put it into practice and see how it's received. Um, and I I found you know, like with anything, practice practice makes perfect. Um, you could try if you're feeling quite creative. You could go into your uh, spin up a trail trailhead org and put together your own data quality scoring strat uh, scoring process. I take it take it by object and then mock up some dashboards and list views um, that will help people to spot their dirty data. Um, I used to almost do it as a package for each um, new implementation. I used to offer them um, a dashboard that would show adoption and then a dashboard that would show dirty, horrible, disgraceful data. Um, so that would help them to monitor it. And then they'd phone sort of four months down the line and say, um, my reports are really bad. What's going on here? And I'd say, have a look at your dashboard. And, they, and the answers were all there. Um, so that's a nice um, hands on activity to to go and practice. Um, some must reads, of course, the, the resource guide. Um, when I was studying, I used Pat Penner Herrera. I think that's how I pronounce his name, bless him. Um, he did a really fantastic Quizlet. And the, what differentiated that Quizlet was that it was a set of flashcards and they were completely based on your knowledge um, of the co key concepts within the resource guide. So there was absolutely nothing dodgy in there at all it was just a really good way to test your knowledge if you've got um, I work really well with flashcards um, I created a trail mix so if, so if you want to go and use that trail mix um, I've linked to it in my blog but also I've put, put, bleh, put it on the slide here for you as well so if you want to click on if you just click on the link in the slide um, that will take you to the trail mix which includes lots of different trailhead modules um, to support you with this exam and then I can't sing the praises of this Dreamforce session enough. Um, I found a really, really good video, which was all about data governance and stewardship on, on YouTube. So I've linked to that video here for you as well. Um, it's well worth watching. Um, and then you'll be a data quality and stewardship and governance expert. So thank you very much for coming. Um, if you're not a member already, please come and join our Trailblazer community group. Um, don't forget to tell us who you are. And if you've if you've passed any exams, please do post it and share it with us because, you know, we, we love to share and celebrate your successes as well. Um, feedback, as always, is a gift. Please don't worry about offending me or anything. I would really like to I'd really like to make these sessions um, worthwhile. Um, and if you want to volunteer to come and run a study group, I think we have one already for next month. Um, and we would love to have you come and host a study group for us so it doesn't feel like I'm sat here lecturing you every time um, but you know we just what we would like to get to know know as many of you as possible um, 
tweet us if you're struggling or you you want to ask a question um just tweet us and use the hashtag ladies the architects and, and we'll all respond to it and there are lots of um lovely gentlemen as well who are who would love to be involved and, and help to support us um throughout our journeys to through the application um, and system architect exams thank you very much everybody take care and i really hope you enjoy the rest of your evening Thank you. Bye-bye.